I am. <laughs> we are now on Facebook and I'm Jen Clymer. This is Creative Chaos from MPTF's Wasserman campus. We are thrilled as always to have Inside Hollywood with Hawk Koch. I'm gonna hand it over to Freda Johnson to introduce him and the series. Uh, today is episode 240 of Creative Chaos, and it's the first episode of season two. I, mean, I haven't talked for 240 episodes. <laughs> Not say. yet, but we're counting. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I will see you a little bit later. I cannot wait to watch your interview with Andy. Well, thank you. And, you know, I don't really know why I'm here every time to introduce you, Hawk, but I really love doing it. And one of the things that is so great about this show and creative chaos. It's sort of like the postal service with neither snow nor rain nor gloom of night will keep the mail from coming. Well, even the Delta variant won't keep this show from coming. So it's gonna be a great show. Thank you for everything and see you on the other side. Okay, well, thanks, Freda. Thanks, uh, Jen, and uh, good morning, uh, residents and friends. Uh, on Zoom with me today is the extraordinary television producer, writer, director, executive, and author, Andy Friendly. Aside from all his amazing work for NBC's Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder, you may remember that, he put together from scratch the still running Entertainment Tonight, one of the longest running shows, well, like I, I guess except for 60 Minutes, he programmed the nighttime part of CNBC to great success and was president of King World. Andy has been on the board of the Shoah Foundation, is a past president of the Saban Community Clinic and past president of the Hollywood Radio and Television Society. And while he was doing all that, he wrote his memoir, Willing to be Lucky. His latest success was the great documentary, Liberation Heroes, The Last Eyewitnesses, which is still playing around the world. His father, the legendary Fred Friendly, cast a huge shadow, and yet Andy became as much of a legend as his dad. And another unreal story we will get to is his marriage to his crush from the time he was a kid, Pat Crowley. What a life. Welcome, Andy Friendly. Are you there? I am, hey Hawk, how you doing? Okay, wait, I'm, I'm great. I'm great. It's so good to see you in your Nike golf shirt. He's also, Andy's also an amazing golfer. No, uh, hardly. You, uh, I, heard, I heard you were real good and I'm not about to try and be there with you. And so, I, uh, we're going to start from the beginning. Okay. So Andy, where did you grow up and what was your upbringing like given, you know, who your father was? Um, good. Well, that, that's a good first question. It gives me a chance to just correct the record. Uh -oh. uh, I am not, not even in the same league as my father when it comes to being a legend. So I just want to get that. You were being very kind, but we have to be accurate. Anyway, um, no, I, I grew up in New York City, um, Peter Cooper Village, and uh, moved to Riverdale in the Bronx when I was two. And grew up uh, in the cutting room at CBS News, shining shoes for my dad and his colleagues at 10 cents a pair so that I could uh, get half of the money I needed to buy my, my baseball glove for a little bit, because that's how dad did it. He didn't just buy your glove. You had to earn 10 bucks to match his 10 bucks to get the Rocky uh, Calavito Spalding model that I wanted. So. That's, wow, that, that, that's a lot of shoes. Yeah, a lot of, lot of shoe shines, including Edward R. Murrow's and Howard K. Smith's and all the greats. Uh, at did CBS. you get to spend time with Murrow? I did. I, you know, he was around quite a bit, as you would imagine, um, in the, of course, in the cutting room at CBS, putting the programs together. And at our home um, and at his farm in Pauling, New York, where he would go on the weekends as a kind of retreat, get away about an hour and a half north of the city. He had a working dairy farm. And we would go up there as kids and stay for weekends. And he taught me how to drive a tractor and shoot a 22 rifle. And uh, it was great being around. This, this was Murrow. This was Ed Murrow, yeah. Wow. And so 
so your father kind of started the whole news. Tell us about what how he started the I mean, see it now and everything he did with Murrow. Yeah. Well, he he uh, dad grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, born in New York. Uh, his father passed away when he was only 11. His mom, who was about not quite five feet tall, raised him as a single child. He was a big guy. He was dyslexic at a time when people didn't understand that. <clears throat> and uh, kind of, he was always in trouble. He, they thought he was dumb. He was not a good student because of the dyslexia. There was no one there to explain that or correct it. And it's funny. It's 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 funny. I've heard that several times during my interviews. Robert Benton, who, as you know, won Oscars for Kramer versus Kramer and Place in the Heart. Till he was eighteen, he was dyslexic and he couldn't see. And this is the second or third person of that kind of genius who started out dyslexic. So sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I thought that I was just, interesting. I just heard Richard Branson last week being interviewed who just flew to space and uh, Bezos this morning talking about his dyslexia growing up. So I think a lot of very talented, smart people, uh, you know, were misunderstood and treated as if they were slow or dumb or whatever the word is. And uh, I think in the end that becomes a motivator for, for those people who are extremely intelligent. And uh, in the case of my dad, he, he really, didn't become the man that he became until he, he went into the army. And he called that his Fulbright scholarship. He uh, served in the CBI theater in China, Burma, India, writing for the, the army newspaper there. Oh, so he was a journalist. He was a journalist and he developed his leadership skills, became a master sergeant, and he became a very good writer and uh, his superiors and the generals all enlisted him to speak to the troops about the war effort because he was a great speaker and he, uh, he could really motivate people. He came back from the war and uh, started his career in uh, radio in Providence, Rhode Island with a, a little documentary series called Footprints in the Sands of Time, which he wrote and narrated at which point he's changed his name from Ferdinand Walkenheimer, which was his father's name, jewelry salesman, to Fred Friendly. It's a little more uh, radio friendly. His news director friendly. his yeah. news director said, you're gonna have to change your name. So he picked Friendly. And uh, he's named after uh, his his mother and his grandfather on his mother's father, S. H. Friendly, who I'm named after, Andrew S. H., who's the first mayor of Eugene, Oregon, who was one of the first uh, Jewish families to end up in the Pacific Northwest in the 1880s. And he started a little general store out there. His family had come from, immigrated from Germany and uh, became mayor of the town. And now there's a hall at the university where he was a benefactor named Friendly Hall, where one of our granddaughters went. We went up and visited recently. So. That's how he got into broadcasting, and eventually he made his way to New York because he, you know, Providence was not going to be big enough for him, and uh, struggled. Met my mother Dorothy there, who was a researcher at Time Life, and they could barely afford to eat and pay the bills. Um, he had an idea for a record album uh, chronicling the events of the last several decades, including the war. Uh, that he had been in and it was called I Can Hear It Now. And he somehow met in a, in a bar at 30 Rock, Jap Goode, who was an agent for a lot of news guys who took a shine to my dad, liked the idea, introduced my dad to Ed Murrow, who was then, this was before television, a, a star on radio who had just reported about the war in London and from the rooftops of London during the Blitzkrieg and was probably the closest thing in, a, in our country to what younger, now older, but <laughs> viewers knew of, of Walter Cronkite, people like that. Ed Murrow was, was the, the, the leading newsman and journalist 
And he liked my dad and he liked the idea and he said he'd be willing to narrate the, the record album. And they took it to a bunch of companies and it was rejected. But then there was, a, this was kind of interesting, there was a musician strike going on. So all the studios at Columbia Records were empty. So Goddard Liebertson, who ran Columbia Records, great pioneer, said, well, let's do this. We have nothing else. We can't use musicians. They're on strike. Let's do this. It'll be inexpensive. And Ed Murrow's a big star. So they did this record album together. And it worked. And it, it really sold because there was nothing else out there. And people were interested. And they put together an audio history of the war and everything else. And that those that, they did two more of those albums, which sent my brother David, who you know, and my sister Lisa and I through college and got my dad on his feet and able to stay in New York. They did a couple more things on radio and eventually CBS approached Ed and my dad to make the transition from radio to TV in 1951. There was no TV news. And my dad was pretty gung-ho about it, although he didn't know anything about production. Murrow was a little more circumspect. He, he really liked the radio. And he was concerned about the potential for television to dilute the message, to cheapen it somehow, to become gimmicky. He didn't understand the medium. So he was fairly circumspect. But my dad found the best cameramen from Hollywood and audio people and lighting people, and they learned how to do it. And he, he had gained Ed's trust, and Ed trusted him to try it. So they did a program. Uh, the Week I Was Born premiered on, in November 1951 on CBS in primetime called See It Now. And the first thing they did is they showed a live picture of the George Washington Bridge on the East Coast and the Golden Gate Bridge on the West Coast simultaneously in black mm -hmm. and white. People would see it on their little TVs, which no one, no one watching today, well, that maybe some of your viewers remember, but we had a big box of wood and a screen that was this big, black and white, but they showed that image. And that's how See It Now began. And the country was mesmerized by it and by, not just by the news guys, but, but the entertainment guys making the transition, Milton Berle and Bob Hope and Jack Benny and Lucille Ball from radio, which was the dominant medium to television. So it and was- then, And then he, I guess the major one that caught everybody's attention was uh, Murrow's uh, interview with Joe McCarthy. Yes, um, for the first few years, and uh, we're hoping to make a documentary about all of this. Uh, Vanessa Roth, the Oscar winning director of our film, Liberation Heroes, that we did two years ago for the Shoah Foundation and Discovery. And I, and Casey Murrow, Ed's son, and uh, my nephew, Noah Mark, who's executive producing uh, Emergency Call for ABC right now, we're, are working on a documentary about all this, about the transition from radio to television and about their partnership, Ed and Dad, and their friendship, which is amazing. And these are two diverse guys who Ed was came from a lumberjack family and dad from dyslexia and a single mom and lost his dad. And, but anyway, we're trying to get that funded now. Okay. And so yeah, I'll, I diverge, but, uh, <laughs> but we're trying to tell the story and, and the, it really, as you pointed out, the heart of it goes in the most dramatic part, which was documented by George Clooney and Grant Hesloff in their Oscar nominated five or six nominations film, Good Night and Good Luck, was when they took on Joe McCarthy. Uh, it was the first time that television news had been used to tackle a truly controversial subject. They had done other documentaries and they were good, um, but this time the country was in great peril, not too dissimilar to what we're going through now, where a, a demagogue divided Americans one against another using the fear of communism at that time. And that communists had infiltrated the government and the State Department and the army. 
and he, he did very well, junior senator from Wisconsin. He used that fear of, of one another to divide the country and, and further his own political ambitions. And no one would take him on because he was a bully. And it was a time of blacklists. And it was a time of, of Red Channels, which was a book that every network executive had. You can imagine this. People can imagine it. On every desk at CBS and NBC and ABC and every studio, there's a book called Red Channel. And if your name was in it, you couldn't work if you were a composer, an editor, a writer. People were losing their livelihoods, committing suicide. It was a very interesting time in America. There was a baby boom going on right after the war, a time of great prosperity. People buying houses and cars and moving out to the suburbs, but there was also this very dark period of, of fear of one another and uh, paranoia. And he explored that. They decided to take him on. It was the first just time. To, just TV because news. it's personal to me, uh, some of you who may have read my book, but uh, certainly know uh, that a man named Howard Koch wrote the one of the great films of all time, Casablanca, along with the Epsteins. And my father's name was Howard Koch. And he was an assistant director and I was about six, seven years old and the phone rang at home and there was nobody home. So I answered it and a very gruff voice said, uh, is your father there? And I said, uh, no, uh, can I take a message? I'm six year old, right? And he said, you can tell your father, he's a blank, blank, blank. I won't swear on, to, on our show. Blank, 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 blah, 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 communist pig and hung up the phone. So when my dad got home a few minutes later, as any good six-year-old would do, I said, hey, dad, I, there's a message for you. And I repeated exactly what the man had said, ending with communist pig. And my dad, as an assistant director making about, you know, a hundred bucks a week, was scared stiff and changed his name to Howard W. Koch so that he wasn't, people knew he wasn't the same. So as a six-year-old, I was a little bit older than you. I remembered very well the Red Scare. So just, a, just now, another story. And by the way, you know, I want to, before we're done here, I want to, I know we're going to talk a, a little bit about your dad and your relationship with him, which I read about in your wonderful book. And we have some very similar tracks. Um, Casey Murrow, my good friend who I'm working with now on this project, who's Ed's son, had to have bodyguards take him to school because when, when they took Murrow, when Murrow and dad took McCarthy on, that was the level of threat. Wow. This was a seven-year-old boy. And uh, that I didn't know, wow. We're dealing with all, all of that in our country. But before they took on McCarthy, I think you'll find this interesting. Ed was smart enough to say to dad, we need to find the little story before we tell the big story. So a lot of people were after Ed and dad to do this program, but they didn't want to do it until they really had the story. And others wouldn't, were not taking him on. Even the president, Eisenhower, wasn't taking on McCarthy. He was too dangerous and scary. Um, so they were under a lot of pressure to do it, but my dad, Murrow said to my dad, we're not doing it until we can find a real American story, small story, and then illustrate that. They found the story of a Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Milo Radulovich, 26-year-old family man, weather forecaster for the Air Force, commissioned officer who lost his commission because his father and his sister had once attended a meeting of the ACLU, which McCarthy had granted a communist front, which of course is ridiculous in itself, but guilt by association. So they went out, they get this 26 year old, very articulate young man to talk on camera. And he, the army, you know, asked him to renounce his association with his father. And he said, I'm not gonna do that. If I do that, my son might have to do that for me someday. And he was so, so articulate and so moving. They ran this program about Milo Radulovich. And two weeks later, the Air Force reinstated him to his full commission. And that showed the power of broadcast journalism and television. No one had ever used it or done it that way before. And that gave them the impetus and the courage and the con 
conviction to go do the McCarthy program eight months later. Well, can, really can, we, seems, can we see, can we go on YouTube and look up the See It Now in that episode? Yes, Milo Rojilovich, The Case of Lieutenant Milo. Wow, Rojilovich. I'd love to watch that. It was uh, 1953, like November, October, and then six months later, the McCarthy program, which really they hung him by his own petard. They filmed all his speeches and all his crazy rhetoric around the country, his attacks on people that were just with Roy Cohen and Bobby Kennedy was on his uh, committee, which is pretty shocking. Yes, I remember. It was a different time, and uh, it showed the power of television to take on controversial subjects. And that broadcast, followed by the Army McCarthy hearings a year later, really was the beginning. History is set judged to be the beginning of the end of McCarthyism. So these two guys risked everything to do it. Ed was already a star. My dad was just trying to eke out a living and it's a new career with a couple of young kids and they were threatened physically and their careers their sponsor on alcoa stood by them but paley and and sam the guys at cbs were nervous as hell cbs withdrew their ads for the show which they normally ran my dad and murrow spent their own money to take out an ad in the new york Times. it was a pretty chilling time and colleagues of theirs at cbs being attacked by McCarthy committed suicide. It was a frightening time, and it showed the enduring power of TV news to do good and to change. So, so because of that program, did that did that uh, stop McCarthy? What what stopped? It McCarthy? really did. That was the beginning of the end. Once Murrow came out against him, and the switchboard at CBS lit up. You know, millions of people watched that program. And this was a new medium in its infancy. And it, you know, as I said earlier, they didn't know if it was going to work. Murrow is circumspect, but this really showed the power of broadcast journalism. And from that on. Sorry, I just want, I, because I want to move it along. That's amazing. And I'm sure everybody's interested. And I want to know now your father is already a legend for what he's done and you're a young kid. What was that relationship with like with a, a dad that was that powerful, that big, and you're just a little kid living in the Bronx? Yeah, well, to me, he was just dad. You know, he would, uh, he, he was, it's a different time. He wasn't home a whole lot, I'll be honest. Um, I see how our family interacts with their kids now, and they know everything they're doing 24 hours a day, and they're involved and they're helping. It wasn't quite like that, and I'm, I'm not sure how yours upbringing was, but my dad was at the office seven days a week. He would actually come home for dinner, to have dinner with us up the West Side Highway to the Bronx, Riverdale area, and he'd have dinner when he could, and he'd help me with my homework and my brother David and sister Lisa. He tried his best, and he'd come to an occasional football game of mine or Little League, but not very often. And that's okay. I didn't really know any different, you know. Um, and he was he would come home and then he'd go back to the office. <laughs> he'd go back and work till one in the morning and then he'd come home and get up at seven and leave. And it was seven days a week. I mean, you're doing... So it was tough. Um, I wish I had had him more, but he, he also took me to the office all the time. That's where I lived a lot of the time. You, the had, you had some great... Uh, you got to meet a lot of... Uh pretty uh, important people along that way. Yeah, but I didn't know they were important at the time. Right. To right. me, Leo, the camera projectionist up in the booth, was the coolest guy there. He was more interesting, more important to me than Ed Murrow right. or R. K. Smith, although right. I knew they were pretty important. So, um, you, so you went on and then you went to college and, and then from college you went to USC film school. Yes, so I obviously did. you wanted to you wanted to, in some way, emulate your dad. And I understand you had uh, quite a class of, tell us about that first uh, student film. I will, um, you know, just let me very briefly put a button because we're both producers on this, on the Murrow friendly years, because it's kind of sad. Um, and, and we are telling this story. So I just want to be true. It, you know, they, they did great at CBS for a while and they were appreciated and heroes. But in time, and they went on to do a lot more great work, Harvest of Shame about the migrant workers and CBS reports, but 
in time, with the rise of the quiz shows and other other programming, it's, the documentary moved out of prime time. They were, they lost their show. They were moved to Sunday afternoons, the graveyard uh, slot. Murrow went out of favor. Dad went out of favor, and they both left CBS in on not the best terms. And they had a um, Ed went on to work for Kennedy at the USIA. My dad stuck around, became president of CBS News. Um, that job didn't really fit him. He was more of a producer. And then when the Senate Vietnam hearings ran and CBS refused to air them live, my father, in a big news story, left CBS. He quit the presidency. Front page, big headlines in the New York Times over that decision where he just saw the heyday of television news, which they, they saw the advent of fade away and in favor of much less expensive program, less important. And, and then he, he went on to PBS to do other things, to teach at Columbia and the Ford Foundation, and things like that, and do the seminars at PBS. So to answer your question, sorry, um, I just wanted to explain that that's, that was the sad and strange ending to this amazing partnership. And, it, you know, it's today, I'm always asked, and I'll, I'll end on my dad here, what he would think about what's going on. I know that he'd be very heartbroken that there's a dearth of documentaries on the networks now and that the work that he and Ed did, you know, you can now see them occasionally on PBS, on Frontline, other places, but he'd be heartbroken by that. And, uh, you know, the problem is that, you know, it's very hard to understand the world and documentaries help you do that. So anyway, uh, hopefully they will return and there's some great ones being done in other places, Netflix and HBO and CNN many others. So to answer your question, yeah, I, it was always, I guess, going to be my life to work in TV because that's what I knew. And that's, you know, I've been around the cutting room so much and out on shoots and with my dad, with President Truman and Eisenhower. And I loved it all. You did your 10,000 hours before. Yeah. You, and you I guess, it. you know, I didn't realize at the time, but that was sort of my education. And, uh, but I was not interested just in news. And I was really a huge fan of Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, the Cabot Show on ABC, and my dad got me tickets to go to a taping at 30 Rock of Carson and ABC down the street with Cabot when I was about 14. And I remember I just like fell in love with those shows and the production of them. And I kind of knew that my career was going to bounce back and forth between news and entertainment. So uh, went to Occidental for two years uh, in Eagle Rock ran the radio station, a little radio station there, and worked in the TV studio and made some films and thought I was hot stuff. Transferred to SC Film School in my junior year. And uh, I thought I was pretty hot stuff, but I ended up uh, learning very quickly that I wasn't. So, <laughs> you know, to get in there is very tough. Our first assignment was to do a five minute black and white film, which is still the case when you go there. A number of our family members and friends are going. And uh, I made mine about a little, uh, a DJ at KMET, the big rock station, who did a show with a pet monkey, black and white, five minutes, MOS, no sound. And we screened our films about two months later in the big theater at USC at the film school. And all the faculty was there and a lot of important people. And I, you know, we were all, we had our hair down to here and we were in the tight jeans and the boots and very cool. And my good friend, Bobby Roth, who's brilliant director who made Heartbreakers and Dead Solid Perfect and who's watching today. Uh, and we've been friends for 50 years. He made a great film when everybody stood up and applauded. And I realized this guy's in a different league than me. And then there was a guy down at the end of the, the row who was my friend, Bob, and he was like classic nerd. He had the pocket pencils, the, the uh, glass, thick glasses with the Band-Aid holding it together. Very square guy. We were all these hipsters. And uh, he got up and showed his little five minute film, which has now been seen by every entering class at USC since and will forever. It was about a elevator in the apartment building. He grew up in Chicago. No sound, just the gears going, the most beautiful photography and editing of this elevator. It's called The Lift. And his name was Robert Zemeckis. And when the film ended after five minutes, there was kind of silence, stunned silence for about 
felt like five or 10 seconds, and then a standing ovation that went on for about 20 minutes. And I realized maybe I'll go into producing. <laughs> yeah, and Zemeckis has done all right. He's done all yeah. right. Good story, really good story. So what was your first job after you got out of college? Well, I, I wanted to try to work in film, but I needed to make a living. My dad, as I mentioned earlier, made us earn our money to buy a baseball bat. He also said, look, I'm gonna put you guys through school and you'll have what you need and then you're on your own. <laughs> so don't expect any help. So, and he was serious and that was his way of raising us and now I appreciate it. I didn't necessarily appreciate it at the time while my other friends were getting, you know, a lot of help, and apartments and BMWs and, you know, I was driving a car that had to start on the side of a hill to get the, the clutch <laughs> to pop to start it and had a leak in the roof. So if I ever did have a date, it was, they get rained on when it rained. And uh, anyway, I, I knew I had to get a job. And he said, I'm gonna help you once, once only. So you better make it work. He got me an interview at Channel 4 News in New York uh, to be a summer replacement researcher on the local news. Two month tryout, 153 bucks a week, 1973, August 5th. I remember walking into 30 Rock I had one little sports jacket and two shirts and two pair of pants. And I was living on my mother's couch in her apartment on 66th Street, taking the subway down. And um, I had this tryout and I, I, I researched news stories and found stories for them to do. I remember the first story I ever found was about the first female bus driver in New York City. I saw a little article in the back of the Daily News. So I suggested that to my assignment editor and I was off and running, and eventually the nice people who worked at Channel 4, including Frank Field, the great weatherman, Marv Albert, the great sports guy, kind of took me under their wing and edited. The camera guys let me go out on shoots. The editors let me hang around. And I kind of learned to write the, the weekend weather, and then they let me do the weekday weather and sports. And eventually they let me go out with a crew and shoot some pieces, and, and I became a field producer and went up to do my series at Attica Prison after the riots, and I got to go to London to interview Paul McCartney, which I somehow made happen. As a, that's kind of the title of my book, Willing to Be Lucky. Well, I, that, that's what I wanted to, I yeah. wanted you to lead into that, which is why is the title of your book, Willing to Be Lucky, and with McCartney and, and Attica, I know how that ties in, so why don't you tell us? Yeah, I mean, those were just, once I learned, you know, to be a researcher, and once they trusted me enough to do a little writing and I learned to write from these great news writers. And I, you know, that's the best advice I can give anyone. If you want to be in this business, learn to write. And writing news is the best thing you can learn to do because it's the hardest, but once you learn it, you can take like reams of wire copy and, and create a 30 second story and go down to the lab at the times, match up the film and make it all work, give it to the anchor. You can do anything. It's the hardest job in the world. And it's, 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 it's my favorite line from Neil Simon's The Odd Couple, where they ask Jack Lemmon what he does. And he says, I write the news for television. Mm -hmm. And the Cuckoo Pigeon sisters say, oh, really? Says, where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> right. And That's Jack Lemmon goes, from the news. So, what, so yes, I love it. That's tremendous. God, he was great, Jack Lemmon. We, we worked with him once, Snyder and I interviewed him for one of our primetime specials. What a wonderful man he was. And uh, all those Billy Wilder films, The Apartment. Anyway, yeah. um, but that was, you know, that, that was when I, when I got my feet under me and learned to write and, and shoot and edit. You know, then I started thinking about things I really wanted to do. So I started a correspondence with McCartney's uh, brother-in-law. I was a huge Beatles fan, got to see them live when I was 14, which is one of the great experiences of my life. And I, uh, like every other kid my age, was in love with the Beatles. And they had broken up and I wanted to try to get an interview. So I, I went for six months corresponding with his, his brother-in-law, Linda Eastman's brother, who was his lawyer, John Eastman. And it was a flat rejection, flat rejection, flat. And I just kept writing. And that was willing to be lucky because my dad 
would tell us that growing up. Uh, it's a quote from the author, journalist, uh, essayist E.B. White, who wrote a number of wonderful books, wrote for The New Yorker. And that was his expression. If you're going to live in a city like New York, you've got to be willing to be lucky. And that's in inscribed in the city hall in marble on the wall. There. Mm. Mm. And so that was my thing. And that's how I, I, you know, was able to get Jimmy Cagney to do one of my primetime specials. For, he had turned down 60 minutes and Barbara Walters, but I, I, I developed a relationship with his, with his caretaker. He was living in a little on his farm again in Pauling, New York, near Ed Murrow's. He is retired, although he came back to do ragtime on Broadway, but he was about 80. And he was living a very quiet life. And he was one of my heroes. And I, I just wanted to interview him so much for one of these Tom Snyder specials, which we were doing for NBC. They were just like the Barbara Walters specials, if you may remember. And again, it was agents, no. Manager, no. Publicist, no. You know, why are we going to get him when Mike Wallace and Barbara Walters? But I developed a relationship with this woman. And it was writing to her for about six months. And one day I got a letter back saying, Mr. Cagney would like to meet you. Would you drive up to Pauling? Unbelievable. You know, I'm, I was just beyond excited. You we were like, what, 24, 25? I was about 27 then, yeah. 27. That's great. And I drove up there and uh, met with him. It was surreal. I'm sitting with this guy who's my favorite actor of all time. And uh, we had a nice chat. And he couldn't have been nicer. Just very pleasant, low key. They made me a sandwich before I drove home. And, and at the end of it, he said, bring your friend Tom up and let's let's do the interview. So I went back and told Tom Snyder and Pam Burke and Bruce McKay and all my colleagues, and Ricky Carson, everybody at NBC. And they were just all so excited and thrilled. And we went up there a month later with our crew, spent a day with him on his horse farm and yeah, but wait, 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 wait. Now you can't jump over this, but you set everything up. You're all ready for the interview and you've got a few hours left. Yeah. And I think they suggested maybe you go for a horseback ride. I, uh, I was hoping you were going to avoid that one, but okay, I'll tell you now. Just, <laughs> uh, we had, we, yeah, we got up there early and set up uh, our director, George Paul and our crew and we had about three hours to kill before Snyder was going to get there. He was driving up from Manhattan. So Mr. Cagney said, well, why don't you take your, your gang, your crew down to the stable and go for a ride? You know, uh, here's whatever her name was, a nice young lady who ran the farm and the stables. She'll take you and have a nice, nice time. He didn't have to do that. So we get down there and of course, as the producer, I'm the first up on the horse. Now, Snyder, of course, you know, had to tell the story for two months after it happened. But I get up on the, she said, well, do you know how to ride? And I said, oh, sure. You know, I had been on the little horses in Griffith Park that are sedated with a little saddle. You can, and they just go about a mile an hour. These were thoroughbreds who had just retired from the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> and I just said, oh, that can't be any different. I'll just get on there and I'll be fine. And I get up on the horse. And within 10 seconds, the horse knew that I had no idea what I was doing and took off in a gallop. And within about five seconds, I had the, the, uh, the intelligence, I suppose, to know I better get off now or I'm going to die. So I bailed off, fell on my wrist, broke my wrist. And for the next eight hours until the interview was over, I had a wrist that was swollen out to here got to New York City to a hospital. Nine hours later, I was in shock. My body had gone into shock from a broken bone. Anyway, it was all but well. Nice, but that's a, that's a real producer. You weren't going to tell right. anybody. You that's sat there. They did the interview. You went through all of that with this excruciating pain. You, what I a producer, just, Andy. Well, producer. There's a picture in my stud, in my, on my bar with me, with Cagney, that I cherish. Somebody took and you can see me holding my wrist. So, but it was well worth it. And then, of course, Snyder had to get on The Tomorrow Show, which he did every night on NBC, and tell that story for about two months. And he had to get on the horse. Oh, yeah, he had to get on the horse. Have you been on a horse since? <laughs> yes, but very slow ones, you know. 
Alice. Well, so we, uh, we skipped a beat because uh, I we went to that story, which is great. But you went from a from a segment producer on a local but big, you know, uh, WNBC News Center Four to now to the Tomorrow Show as a producer. And was that the beginning of the Tomorrow Show with with Tom Snyder, or had it been running? No, I I wrote for Tom. He came into he, he got the Tomorrow Show. Uh, I believe it was 72 or something like that. It was started in L.A. The brilliant Joel Tater was the original producer director. And NBC just wanted to open up 1230. They didn't program none of the networks past 1130. Carson ended at one and they went to the national anthem and the flag and, and the network signed off. People can't imagine that. There was nothing on NBC or CBS or until six the next morning. And Pat Weaver and, and some of the more Warner, the brilliant executives at NBC said, Let, let's try a show at 1230, but let's not spend a lot of money on it. Who can we get? And the Tom was anchoring the local news in LA, killing it. He was the number one anchor, the best anchor they ever had. Tom broke up, Brian Gumbel was the sports guy. Anyway, that was quite a station. So they said, let's let Snyder interview people just in a, on, a, on a two chairs, black background, and we won't spend it. There won't be a band. There won't be a big show or audience. So they give him the show, and Joel and Pam Burke and Bruce McKay and the team just did a brilliant job and got on the air and just made a big splash. And Tom was just so brilliant. And he did interviews like no one had ever seen before. And he was doing subjects that no one had ever done before. He'd have a mafia hitman. They do a lot of show from a nudist colony. Then they have John Lennon or a young Bono, presidents of the United States. But Tom had his unique style, which of course Dan Aykroyd mimicked on SNL, and he became the Tomorrow Show became a big deal. And uh, now, of course, everyone's programming 12:30 with James Corden and Seth Meyers and everyone. But back right. then, it was brand new. Won some Emmys. And uh, you were, you asked me a question, and I completely forgot. That's okay. Doesn't Tom, matter. But I, I just that you went there and you started producing and one of Oh yeah, I was writing for Tom. So they, they brought Tom from LA to New York right. to take over the news because it was not doing well. So I was at Channel 4, they brought him in with Chuck Scarborough to Anchor News Center 4 and brought, moved the Tomorrow Show to New York. And I wrote for Tom and we got along great and he taught me so much. He was such a, aside from everything else, he was a brilliant writer, but he could handle anything on the air live. And the, worse it got, the better he was. Where most anchors would get, you know, flustered. He just, he was born to do live television. And I learned, and we got along and there was an opening for a segment producer on the Tomorrow Show. And he and, and Pam Burke and Bruce McKay hired me to come on to the network. And that was exciting. I was about 24. And that's where I, you know, really got to know and, and, and get very close with Tom. Right. And, uh, I guess one of the people who they were looking for someone to interview a comedian and you, you heard a guy named uh, Letterman, was it? Yeah. One of the ideas, you know, when you're a segment producer on a show like that, it's just, you got five nights a week, an hour, you got to fill. So you're constantly coming up with ideas and one, you know, you want the big names and you want the presidents, Bush and Carter, and you want Muhammad Ali, one of my heroes who I was able to book. And that was one of the great thrills of my life. And, you know, you want innovators, Ted Turner, who had just started CNN. And you want all kinds of interesting, you know, journalists and politicians. But I wanted to do a show on young comics coming up and how they make it. And Billy Crystal is just starting to, to click. And I knew Billy. I had met him through Dick Schaap, and I booked him. And his agent and manager was one of my friends and mentors, Buddy Mora. And I said, buddy, who else he was a legendary manager? Along with Rollins and Joffe, they had Woody Allen. Right. And buddy was just the greatest. And uh, he, he said, well, there are two guys you should have. I, you know, I really think that they'll do well. One is a guy named David Letterman. He's out at the comedy store in LA. The other is Robin Williams. Same, they're both coming up. They're both gonna be great. I hadn't heard of either one. It's like 75 or 60. So I, you know, we had a system on the Tomorrow Show. Um, we also had Rick Noon, who owned Catch a Rising Star, which was the big comedy club in there. And Meryl Marco, who was a writer, Letterman's girlfriend. And we, uh, 
who also Buddy recommended, who was brilliant, and started Letterman's daytime show. But anyway, um, you had to do a pre-interview. The one thing with Tom, he could handle anything that you gave him. But the one thing he would not let you do is put on a, a bad talk. As a segment producer, your job was to make sure they could talk. He didn't mind if the lights went off and everything else screwed up technically. And if, he'd, he'd just have fun with that. The worse it got, the better he would make it. Carson had that too. But if the guy wasn't a good talker, you you were in trouble as the producer. So you do a pre-interview, and every show does pre -interview. So I pre-interviewed Letterman, and he couldn't have been better, and he was just his brilliant, funny self. So we booked him. And then I pre-interviewed Robin Williams, and he was monosyllabic. I mean, he literally answered every question, yes, no. And I just saw a red flag. So at the same time that I claim credit for booking Letterman on his first network show. I also passed on Robin Williams, one of my great, great regrets, but later I was able to have him on Hollywood Squares when we did a special week with Whoopi as the Center Square and Billy and him for their comedy fundraiser that they did every year. Well, thank God but, you didn't you didn't you didn't pass on him the second time. No, and I got to tell him the story and he laughed and he, he was just brilliant. First cool. Year. All right. So now that was a whole segment of your life with amazing people that like, as you said, Elton John, Muhammad Ali, Ted Turner, the Saturday Night Live cast. But yeah, then we move we're on. I'll just say this, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm terrible. I, it was so cool, and you, your viewers will appreciate this. Right down the hall from us in New York, when we did the Tomorrow Show, was Saturday Night Live. We were in 8H, they were in 8G. So they would come down in like, photo bomb our shows. We'd be in the middle of a taping. And if Aykroyd knew the guest or he thought he could get away with a revolution, they'd literally come in and like walk into the interview with like a couple of, of cores, you know, or whatever they were drinking. And they just want to hang out. And Tom had the open bar after the show, the prop bar we called it. So and, you know he used to like to fire up the color teenies as he used to say. Not before the show, usually, although occasionally. I could tell stories about that, Ted Turner, et cetera. But after the show, and then, so the whole SNL cast knew there was an open bar down the hall, and they were rehearsing for days and nights. So they all came and hung out with us. They loved Tom, and they just couldn't wait to be around him. Gilda Radner, Bill Murray, anyway, that was pretty cool time. Did, did, you, did, did you guys interview all of them on the yeah. Oh, yeah, we had them all on the show. And, all right. With Warren Michaels, and you know, we did we had Chevy Chase when he was the, the height of it all in one of our specials. All right. So, was, so we've got to move now. And and another thing that you're 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 asked to write and produce a reboot of This Is Your Life, uh, which was that great Ralph Edwards show where they, you know, surprised people and brought everybody in. And this is a reboot now. And they the I guess the network wanted David Frost. Right, and uh, that was quite a uh, quite a come down, I think, for Mr. Edwards, who I understand was quite a guy. He was he was tremendous. He, Ralph Edwards is one of the early pioneers with Murrow and with Burrow and Benny of Television, starting with a show called Truth or Consequences, and then This Is Your Life, which was a staple on American television for many years. A very kind of I don't know, family viewing, very kind of corny. They'd surprise a big movie star, Milton Berle, at a restaurant. Ralph would show up with a book, and they'd surprise him and say, this is your life, and everyone would be applauding. And then they'd bring on people from their past life. Right. Bring them onto a stage, and they bring them. So anyway, he did that show for many years. It was a huge success. And in 1979, 30th anniversary, NBC asked me to produce a two-hour primetime special celebrating the 30th anniversary. Ralph, uh, all the great clips, two brand new lives, which I'll tell you about in a second, that they wanted us to do. And, uh, but they, they, they wanted to use David Frost as the host. Ralph was a little older and, you know, Ralph was fine with it. He was a real gentleman. Ralph was one of the nicest, smartest, craftsman of this of this medium that I've ever met. He taught me so much. You know, I, my influences were my father and Tom Snyder, who were brilliant, but they were loud, 
firebrands, bulls in a china shop. Ralph was a quiet, distinguished gentleman who never raised his voice, never got excited. And I, I saw there was a different way to do television. Anyway, he taught me so much about that. And uh, he was a crap. So I understand that the two, the first one, the, I don't know if this was your idea, but uh, one of the people you were going to surprise was Charlton Heston. Yes. Uh, as I said, we had to do two new lives and with David Frost. So we ended up doing uh, Charlton Heston, the time, one of the biggest movie stars in the world, and still to this day, you could argue. And Rodney Dangerfield, who was the hottest comic at the time, who was playing at the Sands in Vegas, and we were going to surprise him. We wanted somebody funny and someone said, so. Right. So were, the, were these like, like as good as your horseback riding skills? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I kind of was a little bit overzealous, I would say, on the Heston one. Because I was thinking to myself, well, how can we really make this? The surprise is always the most fun part. And, you know, where are you going to surprise them? And I don't want to do it in a restaurant where he's having a meal. Yeah, it's been done a hundred times. So I was coming up with ideas and talking with my director, Bruce Gowers, who's a brilliant director of all the Grammys and Emmys and, and uh, American Idol and English director. And I said, what if we, he plays tennis every morning at his house in Coldwater Canyon, Beverly Hills, a big tennis player. What if we had Frost in a helicopter descend onto the tennis court with the book and David's in a tuxedo and we surprise him there. And Gowers is going, you know, you're nuts. And the network said, you're nuts. We're not doing that. It's dangerous. There's winds. The tennis court's much too small. Somehow I got him to do it. And we got the go ahead and we did it. And it was the most ridiculous and dangerous thing I've ever done and I never should have done it, but somehow it worked. The biggest fear at the moment was that Heston's toupee, widely known, I'm not talking, was going to fly off its head because of the rotary uh, wind of the helicopters. But it didn't. <laughs> it did sport at first. He was like angry. It was, they thought it was a paparazzi trying to shoot. But then his wife let him know what was going on in his tennis group, and it worked out great. But that was really stupid, one of my stupidest things I ever did. And then the it worked out. I mean, it's great. What a great. It ended up being great, but it was really stupid. Chutzpah. And then, uh, no, it was beyond chutzpah. It was really, really dangerous and dumb. Uh, but we somehow got away with it. And uh, that would have been it. That would have been the end. <laughs> that would have been. Good night. Nice career over at 29. Anyway, it worked out great. And the show did very well. The well, second. Wait, you went to Rodney. Yeah, the next. Backstage. <laughs> The next week, you know, was nowhere near as dangerous, but it was funny. We went out to Vegas and we decided we were going to surprise Rodney in his dressing room at the Sands Hotel before he did the big show with, you know, the big theater there and 3,000 people. And, you know, he, we had all the stage set up and back and all his friends to come out and surprise him and his high school teacher and all his, his first girlfriend. And so we go in to his dressing room just before the show and we barge in with our cameras and David Frost with a tuxedo and the book and Bruce Gowers, our director, we open the door five minutes before he's, and he's there, but you can't see him. You can't see anything because there is a cloud of marijuana smoke that is so thick that you cannot see anyone. And so Gowers, our director, brilliantly just, he's in the trucks, just go, go, tell us the camera, just go in. I don't care, just shoot, go. And Frost is like coughing and Rodney's like shocked and surprised and embarrassed. Anyway, you can't make this stuff up, but it worked out great. And he was, just, he was just hilarious. All right, so now you're 29 and you get a call from Paramount that they have a, an idea for a new syndicated television show called Entertainment Tonight. And you go in and interview evidently with Diller and Eisner and... Uh... Yeah. Can I just say one last dangerous thing? I always do this. I'm your, I'm your first nightmare. Guest. But just to wrap up, just to... Hey, we're just having a conversation. We're just here. having fun. That's, That's what you call them. 
It's like we're just together. And I want to talk about you and managing the Dave Clark Five. That's what I want to say. And making heaven can wait with our mutual friend, Charles Grodner, who just passed away. And some of your stories with your dad. So you got to leave time for that because I want to compare notes. But just to end, put a button on the, this is your life. We had, we had to edit the show. And there were so many clips from all the years, plus the two new lives. And NBC gave us not a lot of money to do the show. We were in a very tight editing schedule to deliver the show for air. We had to edit four days in a row at Compact Video, the leading editing facility in Burbank. We took three of their edit bays, 10 of their editors, 24 hours a day for four days, 72 hours, whatever that is, more than that, 96. And Bruce and I, Gowers, were in different bays editing, slept on an hour at a time, finished the show, delivered it two hours before air. We, we basically ran out of time to get that show on the air. That's another one of those uh, dangerous situations that I would- Not as dangerous as the helicopter. Though. We almost didn't deliver the show. Okay, so now tell us about how Entertainment Tonight came about. Well, that they had done a, a pilot. Um, Al Massini from Telerap had the idea to do this program every night about the business. And, and it was a great idea, give him full credit. They did a pilot, he took it to Paramount, Dill Eisner, and they did a pilot with the great Jack Haley Jr., who I know you knew well. And Jack, uh, after the pilot, they were looking for someone to run the show because Jack was more of a big movie producer and not a day-to-day. -day. So they wanted someone who could do a nightly news program six nights a week, no one had ever tried it, about the entertainment business. And they needed to build bureaus and crews and infrastructure. They had none of that. You know, if you're starting a show like that at NBC News, you've got all that infrastructure and bureaus and around the world, news gathering. They didn't have any. So they said, well, we'll hire this guy. I was up for it with five or six much bigger names than me. But they somehow, Bill and Eisner interviewed me. Jack Haley interviewed me. And they gave it to me. And uh, I showed up in June 1981. And they, I had lunch with them, Diller and Eisner in their private dining room, Rich Frank. And they said, okay, uh, we like the pilot. We love Jack Haley, but he's not going to be on the show. You're going to be on the show and we're going to function pretty much as your exec producers. You're going to be the producer writer. Your office is over there on that sound stage. Go, good luck. You know, <laughs> let us know what you need. So I go over, <laughs> I was expecting, you know, edit bays and infrastructure and a staff and all kinds of things, budgets, bureaus from the pilot that I would be walking into. Nothing. Literally, I had an assistant, an empty sound stage, and that was it. So we had three months to be on the air. And I kind of panicked, to be honest with you. I sat there in the dark in that studio and said, what have I gotten into? I brought on Steve Pasquet, who had done This Is Your Life with me, and some of my other lieutenants who I knew handle it and I said guys get over here let's go to work and we we somehow did it we built all this and hired a staff and producers and writers and directors and artists and editors and cameramen around the country around the world and bureaus and we got it on the air in uh, September three months later six nights a week and it's now 40 years and it'll probably be on another 40 years it's, you know it was a very difficult assignment toughest I ever had and I literally burned myself out after about 52 shows. It was up and running. We got an Emmy nom nomination. I was proud of what we did, put a great team together. And I left. I, I turned 30. I was I literally was getting home at 1 in the morning, getting back up at 4 in the morning, 4.30, to drive back to Paramount, sleeping three and a half hours for six months. That wears on you. It was PTSD. We had a lot of infighting between Paramount the different partners at Cox and Telerep and Almacini. They had a different vision of the show, what they wanted it to be. Diller and Eisner had told me they wanted to do kind of a 60 minutes of entertainment news. The others wanted much more tabloid, which is what the show ended up being. And that's fine. And it spawned a lot of imitators, Access Hollywood and Extra and Inside Edition, which I later went on to do at King World. And it's all good. But, uh, you know, the great team there, continues to do a great job with it. And it'll probably be on forever, just like the Today Show. So I guess you had met Pry Richard Pryor, Pryor, pardon the pun, uh, and uh, 
they asked you, he was about to do a, uh, a big uh, special, I guess. Uh, and uh, so you, you produced this, which I think became a num number one movie. Uh, yeah. was Richard Pryor's comedy special from New Orleans. Uh, and obviously, you know, one of the greatest comics ever. Uh, but I understand it wasn't the easiest thing to do. I, I worked with Richard when he was literally at the very beginning, a movie I did with Sid Caesar that he had a small part in called The Busybody in 1966. So, at any rate, but uh, he was very easy then. And I think my dad did... Uh, a movie right about the time he did that show. My dad produced a movie called Some Kind of Hero with Richard. Oh, I remember that, sure. Yeah, yeah. so. Well, prior, yeah. Prior. Yeah, so tell us, tell us about, you know, the day of the shoot and, and a certain suit that he wanted to wear. Well, just getting, getting to work with Richard was one of the, you know, highlights of my career and life. And, he had done two uh, comedy movies, stand-up specials that were made into films that did very well out on Sunset Strip. And he wanted to do one more. And uh, we were TV guys. We had just done This Is Your Life and Entertainment for Night. And Skip Rittenham, who was just and is the uber entertainment lawyer, genius. I've heard of him. David Nockerson. <laughs> David Nockerson, my close friend and lawyer for 40. You know, they represented Richard and they asked me and my partner at the time, Bob Parkinson, if we were to come in and meet with Richard because Richard wanted to shoot on video and then release it on film, which is how he did it with his others. And Skip and David thought we would get along with Richard. Not everyone got along with Richard. And we knew TV and we were able to bring in the best people and a great crew. Richard directed it. And he shot it down in the Sanger Theater in New Orleans, classical theater. And we spent a year with him rehearsing and shooting a documentary of him rehearsing at clubs around the country and prior comedy store and Dallas clubs. He couldn't have been nicer to us. This was after he had had the terrible fire and uh, almost died. And But he was off of drugs and he, he was just great. So all the horror stories we were anticipating never happened. It was just great. For a year until two days before we were going to shoot the film we were going to shoot it over three nights three shows at the sanger theater and he had picked out a beautiful outfit to wear and our crew and all the great best directors and camera you know lighting guys uh and kenny patterson the brilliant cameraman and all the greats were there and it was all everything was just great it was too great and Day of the dress rehearsal, Richard walks in with Jim Brown, our exec producer, another hero of mine. I'm working with these heroes, Jim Brown, the greatest football player of all time, who I grew up watching as a kid at Yankee Stadium with the championship New York Giants. And he walks in and he's wearing a different suit than the one we had picked, which was a dark green thing that went great. He's wearing this bright white striped silk shirt uh, and suit that he found in a store in New York. And he's going, isn't this great? I'm going to wear this on the show. And all our guys are looking at me going, oh my God, this is a nightmare. So we gently put it, we try it, and all the chroma levels go off off the charts. You can't show a white suit, shiny white suit on television because it flares out, make a long time. So we gently try to explain this to Richard. We try to get Jim Brown to help. He's not having, he goes, I'm wearing the suit. You guys fix it, make it work. He walks out, does his little sound check and his, his blocking rehearsal and he leaves. And we're going, well, this isn't gonna work. So we tell Jim Brown, we figure, he can't do it. He goes, well, if I were you guys, I'd find a way to make it work. So for the next five hours, we call every wardrobe person in Hollywood, everyone in New Orleans, we're going to dry cleaners, we're going everywhere. Can you do anything to take the shine off of this? Maybe mood it down a little, mute it down. Long story short, we don't sleep that night. Bob Parkinson and I end up, uh, no one can help us. No one's budging. Prior, we think is just effing with us, but he's not. And he's, we went to his suite 11 at night with Richard, we can't make it work. And he, first time in a year, was mean to us and said, you, mother of blankers better make the shit work or you're off the show and I'm not 
doing it. And he was dead serious. So we saw this monster that we were afraid of that we hadn't seen for years. One of the cleaners knows a lady who once helped someone dye a, a dress in a bathing in a in a in a in a tub with a bunch of tea leaves. We go over, we wake her up. <laughs> elderly woman. She goes, "Are you kidding me?" I said, "We said we're desperate. Please, any amount of money." We end up in her apartment with the Mardi Gras beads and the five cats at two in the morning. And we put the suit in a bathtub full of tea bags. I mean, you cannot make this up. Honest to God, this actually this has the adv added advantage of being true. We say, okay. She goes, well, I'll have it back to you at 6 in the morning. I get a knock on my door at 9 in the morning. I got a few hours sleep. Our wardrobe person is holding this shriveled up white suit. It's now brown. It's just, just it's shrunken. And I'm just seeing my life and my career just going Past me. We take it to Jim Brown. We go, Jim, this is what happened. We did our best. Tell Richard he's going to have to wear the original. He goes, all right, I'll talk to him. Fortunately, Skip Rittenham had come in from L.A., who Richard listened to. And he somehow talked to him. But we still didn't know if he was going to wear the original suit until he showed up at the live taping in a limo with Jim Brown and Skip at 5.30 that night, half hour before he was going to go on the air. We still didn't know. He didn't give us the word what, or if we were fired. Limo pulls up. He's wearing the original suit. We're standing there, Bob and I. He looks at us, doesn't smile, looks at us with a look like he's going to kill us, right? And we're going, he's about to fire us. And he looks over and he says, dead face, dead pan. You all effed up, I won't use the word, you all effed up my shit. And he holds up the jacket. And then... We just thought we were going to be fired. And he cracks a big smile. And then Jim Brown and Skip started laughing hysterically. And they all go on the show. And then the first two, three minutes of the film is him holding up the jacket, telling the story. He couldn't have been nicer. And the film did go to number one. And it was great. It was a great experience working with a hero and a legend. Now, and now there's another startup. Because we're getting close to running out of time here. We got okay, to talk okay, about. But we got to leave some time for you to talk about. Yeah, this, sure. this was supposed to be a conversation. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, you you go to the startup CNBC, which is a news program, and they're asking you to do the night. You know, to to get some kind of entertainment at night, so it's not just during the day because people turn CNBC off. And uh, I understand. Uh, one of the guys you were working with was a young lawyer named David Zaslav. And you, Zaslav, yeah. Yeah, and you became friends with him, and he was a young lawyer. I, for those of you who don't know, he's the head of Discovery and has been an unbelievable man in our industry. My question is, at that time, you know, like sometimes you're, you're with people and you go not going anywhere, or this guy's got a W on his, on his chest, you know, winner. Were you aware that, I mean, you might've been a good lawyer that he was going to become what David has become? I don't think you can ever know something like that. He was a young business affairs guy, did our deals for us. We got very close because he did the deal with Snyder and with Geraldo and Donnie and Tim Russert, all, all my primetime posts and, you know, we, we went through a, a lot together, uh, some very difficult times and personal times, happy times, became very good friends. And I could see that he was sharp and motivated, wonderful guy, but no one could ever imagine the success and the vision that he had. Right. And now he's dead, you know, they just bought Warners and, you know, they're, he's going to have, he's going to be the number one guy in the business. He already yeah. is. And he's amazing. He's Man, a, I've never met him, but amazing. Tremendous um, guy and a visionary. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Geraldo. One of the people you brought in to CNBC at night was Geraldo. And was it you or was it Geraldo or was it just the timing that you guys hit, you know, got the brass ring with a certain Bronco driving down the, the, the 405? Yeah. The first thing I did, you know, was try to talk NBC into doing talk. No one was doing talk in prime time. We did business news all day, but once the markets closed, nobody cared. 
So, you know, they were doing consumer shows and different things. And I convinced uh, Mark Rosenberg and I and Zaz, a bunch of us convinced Tom Rogers and Bob Wright and Jack Welch to try talk because it's not expensive. The only other talk show in primetime then was Larry King, believe it or not. Now it's everywhere, as you know. So we, we were doing news talk, basically, as you were in a live talk. I brought in Snyder, who was off his radio show, and that was the first key. We got Donahue and, and Mary Madeline and Tim Russer, the brilliant Tim Russer, mm. and a wide range of other. But we got Geraldo, who had been doing that kind of daytime syndicated show. But I knew he was a really smart guy, a journalist. He had been in my dad's class at Columbia, and my dad thought highly of him. He had done the Willowbrook series at ABC. He was a great reporter. He had kind of lost his fastball, but I knew he had it. And when he got to CNBC, we gave him the 9 o'clock time period. And he was doing Bosnia and different topics, but it wasn't really gelling. And I'm watching the NBA Finals in June, and I saw the slow speed chase with the Bronco. And I just said, I called Geraldo, and I said, this is your story. You're going to do this the way Nightline did the Iran hostage story. Every night, you're going to own this story. You're a lawyer. You're going to bring on the best lawyers, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges. And we're going to tell this story because this is going to be the biggest story in the country. And we're going to own it, stake our claim starting tomorrow night, Monday night, because it was a Friday. And we did that. And our ratings went from a 0.1 to a 1.1 million viewers. Uh, our subscriptions went from... 12 to 80 million and Snyder went way up and, and it floated all boats at, at wow. the, and Geraldo did a great job. Wow. Uh, well, from there, and I've got to jump because there's some other things that I do want to get to. You, you were hired by the King brothers oh, at a place called King World. Right. And before we get into what you did there, could you tell our audience how the King brothers, two guys, found a way to uh, buy a couple of pretty big shows from Merv Griffin. Well, I mean, it's, it's one of the great stories in our business ever, and you should make a movie about it. I don't develop movies, or my brother David should. Um, Michael and Roger King grew up driving the car of their father, Charles King, who was one of the first syndicators of the Little Rascals, taking the big 35 millimeter cans of film with the nascent television stations around the country and bought selling. Them. They learned the business from this legendary Sydney Green Street type character, Charlie King, 6'5". He would have them dress in a chauffeur's uniform like they were his chauffeur, his kids. And he taught them the business, right? And they're in their 20s, early 30s, living in an apartment in New York, sharing it with the four brothers, uh, Roger, Michael, Bob, and, and Richie. And they're eating pizza because that's all they can afford. And they get the idea to go to Merv Griffin, who owns Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy on NBC, which are dying there. They're going off. They're going to be canceled. And they said, we somehow get a meeting with them, right? They got to meet. And they say to Merv, let us take these two shows off the network and do them in first run syndication, which is a brand new business. Mike Douglas was the only one doing it. That's where you do new shows. Syndication was for old shows, you know, reruns. But we're gonna do new ones. And Merv goes, he was impressed with these guys, their hoods, but he goes, he goes, well, I got nothing to lose. They make a deal. They buy Wheel and Jeopardy for $50,000. Honest to God, true story. This story has the added advantage of being true. Merv goes, what the hell? They take it out. They can't sell it in New York, Chicago, or LA. No one launches a show without those top three markets. But they got a station in Buffalo to take it. They took a, one in St. Louis, first with Wheel. Show goes on, right away, it does numbers. Now suddenly, New York wants it, LA wants it, Chicago. Within six months, it's a hit show. Six months later, they launch Jeopardy. Same story. That was 1986, something in there. Not exactly sure that. Now, for however many years later, 35, 40, the shows make billions of dollars every year on a $50,000 a year. And it made King World. They went on then to discover Oprah. They had the top three shows in the world. And then we did how, when I went to work for them, we had it. In, they, had, they had already started Inside Edition, which is now in its 40th year, doing great. 
Hollywood Squares, it said Roseanne, it said Marty Short, et cetera, et cetera. And those guys were just, just they were just bigger than life. P.T. Barnum, they brought an excitement and a, to the business and to everything they did. When we would hold a party at the big nappy convention in New Orleans, they'd take over the Superdome and book Elton John when we announced Whoopi Goldberg as our center square on squares. They waited five years. They had the rights and the, 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 they had the prescience to, to, to buy Hollywood squares. But they didn't bring it out right away. They waited. They knew when the market was right. And when they did it, they didn't they fool around. They got Whoopi to be the center square, one of the biggest stars in the world. And they got the great Tom Bergeron on the host. I was helpful in that. But they did everything big. And at the Natby party, to announce all that, in Roseanne's talk show that year, we hired Elton John to play our party. We took over the Superdome, created Times Square. That's how they did things. And the, every other syndicator had to shut down their parties that they had planned for six months. And we had to turn people away. All the station guys wanted to be at our party. And that's how they were. And that's how they did things. Wow. Amazing. And I, I, before we get ready to close, I, I, I feel that we have to talk about um, a young guy who watches movies and watches television and has a crush on a, uh, a certain actress. And uh, uh, this, this actress, Pat Crowley, who had had her own career, big career, as a movie star with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and Barbara Stanwyck, Tony Curtis, and then she, she's got a successful TV show and she's on all of these shows. And you, all these years, you were always, you know, in love with this, this actress, but yeah, nobody's ever gonna get near her. Boom, you go to a dinner party and there she is. What do you do? Yeah, best, best moment of my life. I mean, best thing that ever happened to me, obviously, is meeting Pat. Um, you know, she, I had watched her on TV. She was in the pilot of The Man from Uncle, which was my favorite show. She was on uh, Twilight Zone, which is a sh one of my favorite shows growing up. And I just, you know, I didn't have a particular, she wasn't like my very favorite, I wasn't focused on it. But when I met her at this dinner party at Tom Snyder's house, you know, I was just, I couldn't believe I was sitting there across from this woman who I just had a major crush on as a kid. And, growing up as a teenager and all my friends did. And she was just more beautiful in her personality and her charm than, than anything I could imagine. And we were just friends. I was with someone else and she was married uh, to Ed Hoodstrad, who was a, a giant in our business. And he represented Tom Snyder. He was at the dinner, Bruce McKay and Debbie Vickers, who went on to produce the Jay Leno show for all those. They were there that night. It was one of the great nights. And we stayed in touch. And then I hired her to work on a couple shows I did, one with Gene Kelly and another one uh, in Fred Silverman, another one at Paramount. And we got to be friends. And then when she split up, her, when her marriage ended and my relationship with the woman I was dating ended, I needed someone to go to the opening of the Hard Rock Hotel, my friend Peter Morton. I was going with Roger Birnbaum, who you know, producer, and Terry Garley. And I needed a someone to go with me. And I was working with them. I said, do you want to go to this thing? I need And that was it. We, uh, we had, that was, I've been with her ever since for 38 years. Best thing I ever did. She's a true American story. Father was a coal miner and went down to the mines every day at four o'clock, grew up 4 a.m., grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Somehow moved to New York as her sister and her mother had the guts to, to get out of Scranton. Her sister had some singing talent. They went to New York. A couple of years later, after Ann started some Broadway shows, they had Pat come to New York. She got some work. Next thing you know, she's discovered by a Paramount talent scout in, in a Broadway production she was doing and signed to a contract and was starring with William Holden in Forever Female at 16. And then she did seven decades of work. And uh, I'm so proud of her. She's the really the one you should be interviewing today. She's as beautiful as ever. and the love of my life. Fabulous. So Did I say that right? You've you've achieved you've achieved so much success in so many different phases of television. What gives you the other than Pat and your kids, family? What gives you the most pleasure 
and why? Well, along with all these great success stories, I had plenty of stunning soul-sucking failures that just broke my heart and things that were shows that were canceled that I loved and believed in and uh, disappointments and heartaches along the way. So no career is without those. So I don't want to paint this totally rosy picture. Hey, for anybody who knows, I produced Honky Tonk Freeway. <laughs> One of the greats. Um, before I answer that, because I, I did say we were, you promised we were going to have a conversation. Tell me, because we have, what, 10 minutes left. How was it growing up with your dad? And were you able to, how were you able to step out of his shadow, which was huge, to this enormous career you had, being president of the Motion Picture Association, making Heaven Can Wait, one of my favorite films, along with 20 others. And how did you, how were you able to do that? And was his presence a positive or a negative for you? I'm sure both, as it was for me. Uh, it was both. It was both, and the shadow was always huge. And I don't know about you, but for me, no matter, right up till I was 50 years old, every week, I'd meet somebody who'd say to me, boy, I know your dad. You know, he's the most wonderful man I've ever met. Oh, what he did for me or my mother or my sister or my friend. Please, please say hello to him. They would never talk to me. They'd talk about my father. And it wasn't until I got bar mitzvahed at 50 and actually changed my name from Howard Koch Jr. to Hawk that all of a sudden I found my own place to step out of his shadow. And you write about that beautifully in your book, which I would recommend. I know all your viewers know about the book, but it's really a terrific book. Thank you. How, how did you do on your half Torah? Did you get at 50? <laughs> I did it in English. <laughs> and the bar mitzvah was held in the backyard of a great restaurant, Michael's, down on Michael. Thursday, Michael. Santa Monica. That's one of Pat's favorite restaurants. Oh, right? yeah. I, and I love Michael. We're going strong. They're great people. I don't know if they've reopened after COVID. We used to go there. I think they have. I think they have. Next time I'm in LA, we're gonna we maybe we'll all go together. That would be great with uh, Mike. So, uh, yeah. What gives you the most happiness? Come on. Oh, what's, what's, you know, clearly, just my watching the young people in my family, watching all our nieces and nephews and grandkids, and now our great grandson Henry was just born. Um, you know, just watching them watching all their bright hopes and dreams coming true, getting married, working in the business, a bunch of them, uh, and working with me, a couple of them, on a couple of new projects that we're doing with my brother David. And it's, it's, it's just brings me the most joy, just watching them and, and sharing times with Pat. They all come over on Sundays to our little dog park. And we just did a trip up to Pebble with 26 of them for my sister's birthday and our my nephew's wedding and a big family reunion last weekend. And that's, that's really what brings me the greatest joy. Uh, I, I agree with you. I just had 14 of my family in Hawaii for a week. It was the yeah. best, especially after COVID and the year we went through. Yeah. We Never saw it. Year. Hadn't no seen drama, it. not a band aid. We Lots didn't of fun. Knock wood. All right. We got through it. <laughs> yeah. We made it through event. Free. Right. What was, would you, what would you, Aside from your nephews and your grandsons and everything, but somebody off the street who comes to you, what, what advice would you, get, would you give a young person who wants to kind of follow in your footsteps? If you want to work in, the, in our crazy business, um, <laughs> my answer would be really simply take anything you can get if you're working for someone you trust and like. Sorry about that. Kind of stop. Hopefully. Um, you know, too many people want to, you know, go in at the top. Let me just get rid of this one. And uh, my, my advice is to follow kind of what I did. I was a junior researcher. I worked the overnight shift on the weekends. I went in at 11. I made no money. I got coffee. I could picked up the producer's dry cleaning. Just get in there and do anything. And then once you're in, show them that you're the first one in, the last one out and that you will, you will do whatever is required to, to make it work. And, you know, watch and listen and study, and then you will, you, will, you will impress them. They'll let you go out and shoot and edit, and they'll teach you. 
and they'll support you and then you can you can make it but don't say no to anything if you can find a job as a runner as a gopher go for it as long as it's with a good company and good people i i think it's that's great advice thank you um the last thing i guess we can talk about is your uh your uh doc called liberation heroes the last eyewitnesses uh, it's so important, and what I love about it is, as we've talked about our fathers, there's a legacy there because of what you learned from a letter that your dad wrote uh, many years ago when he was in the service. I guess he was one of the people he, he wrote a letter from Mauthausen. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was uh, my last project, and if it's my last project that I ever do, I'll be very happy. Uh, it was a film we made. Vanessa Roth and I and Jim Beeler and Stephen Smith and Mickey Shapiro and, and CC Chair for uh, uh, the Shoah Foundation. I'm on the board of counselors at USC, which is Steven Spielberg's foundation that he started when he made Schindler's List, getting testimonies of, of uh, survivors and family of survivors and, and other and those who didn't survive uh, after the, the war and after the liberation of the camps. And my dad had witnessed the liberation of Mauthausen as a young soldier and wrote home to his mother about it in a letter we read as a family of the Jewish holidays. And he said at the end of the letter that he wanted us to bear witness and that he wanted us to keep telling the story. And at Shoah, we were able to, before these heroes left, leave us in their 90s now, tell some of their stories. and. We did in a film called Liberation Heroes, The Last Eyewitnesses, that aired on Discovery 2019 and is being seen around the world and will live forever uh, to continue to bear witness. And it's the most meaningful and important project I ever did. And I'm very grateful to everyone involved. There's also his book, Andy's book, Willing to Be Lucky, which I have read cover to cover, uh, which I suggest. Uh, if you like these stories, there's a lot more. And I'm gonna bring in Jen now, who has the last two questions she always asks. Hi, Jen, did you enjoy today? You're muted, Jen. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so, whoa, I... I will confess that I have sent a couple of messages to Hawk during the conversation because you dropped a name or two that resonates with me. Uh, Joel Tater lives in my condo building. Really? I love Joel. He's so uh, smart. He's so unique. Um, and, he's and he's also gotten a lot of uh, love and public attention recently because he was the person who helped reinvigorate the KTLA morning show. Yes, he did. Yeah, He's no brilliant. Brilliant man. Brilliant. True, true. And then the other person, you had another person. The other person was a producer by the name of Milt Hoffman. Milt worked on Entertainment Tonight, did a lot of live TV, and I thought potentially your paths may have crossed. When we started the closed circuit television station about 15 years ago, Milt moved in I think two or three years after it got going and found, you know, his second wind by still having the opportunity to have these wild ideas produced and dig into this community of people and get them involved and get them productive. So um, didn't know if you, you knew Milt or not, but he certainly didn't, was. Sorry. In my heart. Sorry. Didn't know. Okay. You'd like to. Those were not the official questions, though, that we end these interviews with. These are the impossible questions that you must answer before we will let you go. Through the pandemic, we have been asking people for their favorite movies and their favorite television shows, and we are compiling the MPTF, hey, here's the COVID pandemic list. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite TV show? Uh, there's so many, it's very hard to pick. I'd say for movies, it would have to be Godfather 1 and 2 and Schindler's List, Mr. Spielberg's film about the Holocaust. And uh, for TV shows, I would have to say, um, I'd have to go with dramas. I mean, I love the sitcoms and I love 
news shows and 60 Minutes and late night shows, Letterman and Carson, uh, tomorrow's show. Uh, but I would say that I'd have to go with The Sopranos. I'd have to go with Bochka's uh, Hill Street Blues and NYPD Blue. He was a friend of mine who I admired. And I would have to throw in Twilight Zone, Mission Impossible, Growing Up, and, uh, and Man from Uncle. Those would be my favorite. Only because my wife was on two of those. Andy, I have to tell you, this was, I loved this hour and a half. And I know you said at the beginning, gee, I don't know if I could talk for an hour. We could have talked for another two or three hours with everything that you've done in your life. Well, and I hope you enjoyed it because we had a ball. I did. And you make it very easy. And uh, we still didn't get to the interview with you about all the many wonderful films and the work you do with the motion picture television fund, which I'm in awe of. And well, we're, we're going to get you out to the home and let you take a look around and see what we do. I'm out honored to be a part of this and do anything to help that wonderful organization. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in a week or two with another guest. But Andy, again, thank you so much. Jen, Freda, take care. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day. We are taking off from Facebook now and going back to original programming for Creative Chaos here on the campus.